Good morning. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing great, Danny, but I'm disappointed in whoever that was, your producer that you're talking about, with yeah. a clear barrel of cheese puffs, yeah. whatever that is. Yes. If you're going with that off-brand of those things, then you're wasting your time. Planters just brought back their canister of cheese puffs from back those cheese balls back in, like, the 80s. Yes. They just re- we just restocked them, so don't you don't need to be getting the clear ones from Costco or whatever that is. Go uh-huh. back and get the OG cheese balls, cheese puffs, and make it happen the right way. You see, this is why we have you on the show because you're a Renaissance man and hard food takes. That's just as important as a hard football take in our minds, you know. There you go. So I'm, I'm here for the tailgating as well. <laughs> so the tailgate's going to be off the hook tomorrow night in Baton Rouge, and if it's strength on strength. The offensive LSU versus the defensive Florida. Who do you give the advantage to? I'm still going to go a little bit of an advantage to LSU because let's keep in mind, part of this is still very new. Now we've got a couple of games that we've seen it, a couple of games that they've really had to unleash it under what Joe Brady is doing. And keep in mind, I think there's still a little bit of a misconception nationally that this is something that they added or this is something that they went in and just changed. No, they revamped their offense. This is a completely different deal. So there obviously are some things there that they can do, want to do, but have not done yet. That's the advantage LSU, in my opinion. And then I think on the other side of that, when you look at just the amount of points that they're able to score and the way that they're able to put points up, against the fact that Florida's offense is not great, I think that's advantage LSU as well. But when you're digging into the trenches and you're looking at those exact matchups, I do think there's one glaring matchup inside of that matchup that favors the Florida Gators. LSU's had some issues at tackle this year. Now, Sadiq Charles has rolled in and out of the left tackle position. If he's in and he's close to 100%, I think they're okay there. But Austin Deculus has not been great for LSU at right tackle, and they have not been really good at picking up pressure and blitz packages. We know Todd Grantham, Florida defensive coordinator, is going to bring pressure, and he's going to be dialing up from all over the field. So I do think that that LSU offensive line against what Florida is going to want to do defensively and what Florida has defensively poses a very intriguing matchup and could be problematic for that LSU offense. The reality is LSU is going to be – if you limit LSU, what are we talking about, 35 points, 28 points? And, then, and the LSU defense is pretty good, too. So I don't know how much confidence I have in Florida being able to go out and put up 30 or 38 to be able to beat that LSU team. There's still big games left of the schedule after this one for both schools. LSU still has Alabama and Auburn and A&M. Obviously, Florida still has Georgia and the world's largest outdoor cocktail party. But do you think tomorrow night is a college football playoff elimination game? Um, probably more so for Florida, but I still wouldn't say it's an elimination game for either based on the fact that Florida's going to play three consecutive top five teams. And I mean, I, I, there haven't been many stretches like that in the history of college football. If, if they can find a way to get through it and only lose one of them and then get to the SEC championship game and find a way to win that one. The whole interesting deal with these SEC teams, whether you're talking Bama, LSU, Georgia, Florida, is what happens to the one-loss team that doesn't go to Atlanta. You know, that's kind of our outlier there. So what if Florida is that team? Let's say they drop this game. Let's say they beat Georgia. And, well, if they beat Georgia, they'd be in the SEC championship game. But if they're the one-loss team that somehow didn't make it, then all of a sudden, you know, where, where do they stand? Where do they lie? How does, how does the committee look at those football teams? But – I think Florida still got opportunity games, like you mentioned. I mean, they could they could go out and beat Georgia. They can still find their way to get to Atlanta and beat an Alabama that obviously is going to help their resume a ton. And I don't think the I think the college football playoff committee's done a pretty good job of saying, "Hey, it's not the way it was back in the AP days with the bowl slots, where you pretty much have to go undefeated. You're not going to have a chance to play for a national title." They look at resume. They look at the kind of wins, the kind of losses. I mean, the fact this thing's in Death Valley at night is going to be a little bit more forgiving for the Florida Gators as it is. So I wouldn't say it's an elimination game for either. You mentioned just the resume of teams that LSU can still knock off and and still be able to jump back into the top five and be in the playoff picture. There's a lot of big games for other teams except Clemson. But, you know, Ohio State's got some big games down their schedule. Oklahoma's got some big games down their schedule. So some of those other teams that are in the top ten 
also have big games to play, and that could potentially knock them out of contention for the playoffs. Yeah, I like your point about the one-loss team that doesn't make it to Atlanta. I mean, let's look at Florida in this instance. They could win this game tomorrow night, lose to Georgia, not even make the SEC title game. What do you do with a team like that? Cole Kublick joins us this morning here on the show for the SEC Network. Alabama at a and is going to be the 330 SEC CBS kick. And this is an Alabama team that's number one of the country, undefeated, unbelievable offense, Tua once again doing great things, but a defense, surprisingly, that gives up a lot of yards specifically on the ground. Can A&M take advantage of that? Yeah, it's strange. Um, and unfortunately for A&M, no, they cannot. Uh, they are not running the football well this year. Their offensive line has been deficient. They missed Travion Williams in a great way. He was such a productive back for them. And then I think, too, you look at the New Orleans Saints and what they're doing with their offensive line right now, and Eric McCoy is a big reason. The rookie from A&M who played center and guard there the last three years, he has been their most productive, most physical, best offensive lineman, and he is obviously a guy that they need back as well. Jimbo Fisher's offense is predicated on running the football, and D.A., they just flat out can't do it this year. They're not having success with it. They're not getting guys moved at the point of attack, and – I think the more interesting point about the A&M offense is when does Jimbo Fisher sort of make that shift to, okay, we're not going to be a team that can be run first. Let's just go with our elite quarterback and elite group of receivers and see how we can manage it from there. Because it almost cost him the Arkansas game a couple of weeks ago. I thought he tried to stick with the run game a little bit too long, and it wasn't going to be there. The next thing you know, Kellerman and those receivers find a way to get a few points on the board, and they go win that football game. I don't see that being an issue for Alabama. Yeah, they've given up some of the yards. Mobile quarterbacks have hurt them in the past. Uh, you saw John Rice Pumley, true freshman from Ole Miss, that, that was gashing him a couple of weeks ago. That was, however, his first start. They didn't really have a look at what they were going to be doing with him in the lineup. But he's got elite speed. I think Mon can get a little bit on the ground, and that's going to be leaving the pocket and then by design. But are they going to consistently line up and be able to chop off four and a half, five yards of carry and move the chains on the ground against this Alabama defense? No, I don't believe that. I still think Raekwon Davis is too good. I still think D.J. Dale, the true freshman, nose guard is too good. And even with a we with a young, inexperienced group of linebackers, I just don't think that they're going to be able to move these guys and be able to pull that off. Can they do some things through the air? Possibly. But I don't think A&M is going to move the football on the ground. Cole Kublick joins us for the SEC Network. It's not a game that's going to get a lot of national run, but I want to ask you about Tennessee. Mississippi State travels to Knoxville to take on the Volunteers. Volunteers sinking 0-2 in the SEC, 1-4 overall. Another ugly week last week with Jeremy Pruitt. Do you think this is salvageable for Jeremy Pruitt in Tennessee? I do. I think Jeremy Pruitt is an elite recruiter. I think Jeremy Pruitt will get talent there. I think Jeremy Pruitt has been around enough programs that understand how to win, that he can get that thing on track if he's given the time. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be doing Arkansas at Kentucky this weekend, and I think the perfect litmus test for a lot of these ADs and a lot of these presidents and a lot of these booster clubs in college athletics is Mark Stoops. I mean, this is a guy that four or five years ago could have easily been run out of town and then all of a sudden you give him some time, he's able to get some of his players in, and next thing you know, Kentucky puts together a historic season last year. And I think if they don't lose Terry Wilson, they'd have another good season put together this year. But Jerry Pruitt needs time. I mean, this thing was in bad, bad shape. Uh, he's got a great staff that he's assembled there in Knoxville, but it's not going to be a one- or two-year turnaround. I've talked to coaches inside the league that have said, this is one of the most difficult head coaching takeovers that they can remember in their lifetime, and the general public doesn't understand it. So I think there was an attitude. There was a demeanor thing that needed to be completely flipped there in Knoxville. And then some of the good news, there were, there were positive takeaways from last week. Like the, One of the most surprising parts about Tennessee's failures this year is that they actually have some guys. No, I'm not saying they have a too deep of NFL guys, DA, but they've got some guys with talent. And what do you know? Last week, all of a sudden, Jennings makes a few catches. Callaway gets involved and makes some catches. You see Daryl Taylor off the edge. You see Nigel Warrior coming down and making tackles from the safety position. It's like, hey, these are the dudes that we knew were coming back when a lot of people said Tennessee will make a bowl game this year. So I think they're finally finding a way to utilize their playmakers, utilize the talent that they have. I saw some good things out of left tackle, Wanye Morris, in the run game last week. He's a true freshman. Trey Smith had his best game of the year at left guard last week. So some of the guys are coming around. Is it going to be salvageable this year as far as making the postseason and then looking like a very good SEC team? Probably not. But can Jeremy get it right over time? Absolutely. 
Finally, USC Notre Dame at Notre Dame Stadium, South Bend tomorrow night. And Notre Dame's a double-digit favorite of this game, which shows just how far USC has fallen. In your estimation, what's the biggest thing that USC needs to fix so that it's not a fringe top 25 team, but instead is the powerhouse that the Pac-12 really needs it to be? Uh, the first thing I point to is offensive line play. I don't think it's been good for a decade. Now you watch their D line this year, and they're pretty physical. They can get after, you. but it's it's really nice to be able to tee off and throw deep balls 15, 20 times a game. But you can't live and die on that. I mean, you're, you're, you, that's not going to be the foundation of your home. Like that, that's a that's a nice vacation property that you've got that you can go visit every now and then. But you're not coming home from work and you're nine to five every day and living on 15 deep balls a game. Like that's not. Teams aren't built that way. Championship programs aren't built that way. So do they have big physical receivers that can take the top off? Yes. Do they have some talented quarterback? Absolutely. they got to find a way to run the football and run it consistently and generate play action and protect their defense and get them off the field. Those are the things that I think are, are problematic with USC right now. And I think there's still a bit of a depth concern. Uh, I think some of the transfers out the last few years, maybe a couple misses in recruiting has hurt their depth. But I think from a skill position standpoint, the top end looks nice right now. They just don't have enough to make a living on when you're going to play teams like Notre Dame week in, week out. Cole Kublick joining us this morning on the show. You'll watch him SEC Network this week in Arkansas and Kentucky. Joining us, you can follow him on Twitter for the latest on his thoughts around the SEC and college football at Cole Kublick. Cole, it's always good to catch up, my man. Enjoy the game this weekend, and hopefully we'll catch up again this college football season. 